Hey, good afternoon. All right, so I want to welcome all of you back to Notre Dame. Um, my name is Matthew Morrison. I'm the professor for data structures this semester. Um, this is where we're going to meet for all of the classes and for the final exam as well. Uh, when I was out here talking to the uh, maintenance people, I said, let's improve, you would improve because they have, quote, brand new duct tape on the ceiling. So this is going to work out really nice. Um, I also occasionally, uh, either on the first day of lecture or if I sense that the students are stressed out, you have a lot of projects or a lot of uh, exams or something like that, I will bring in Aaron, the pup professor. Uh, so anybody who's uh, feeling homesick or misses their pet, uh, you, when I bring her in, you're more than welcome to do that. Please let me know if you are allergic to or afraid of dogs. I'm happy to make sure that uh, we continue to have a safe classroom environment. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to do uh, to start the course is to go over uh, fundamental things, things from the syllabus, expectations, uh, tips about how to do well in this class and make a couple announcements regarding the lab sections. So the first thing, let me do this. All right, there we go. Is I want to share a quote that's going to motivate the first of first couple of weeks of the semester. And it's a quote from Ashiel Gorky, who's actually an abstract impressionist. And he says that abstract allows man to see with his mind what he cannot physically see with his eyes. Abstract art enables the artist to perceive beyond the tangible, to extract the infinite out of the finite. It is the emancipation of the mind. It is an exploration into unknown areas. The reason I share this is because in order to really master and understand data structures, we're gonna, I'm gonna hear me discuss this idea of levels of abstraction. Up to this point, when you talk, uh, took Dr. Bulalan's uh, in, uh, fundamentals computing course or my introduction to computing for C and C++. You learned a little bit about memory management and you learned about C. You may have worked with pointers, although it's not, it's perfectly fine if some of you were frustrated and didn't understand what a pointer actually is. What we're gonna spend the first couple of weeks of the semester doing is we're gonna dig deep into what a pointer actually is because it's the fundamental to everything that you're coding in C and C++, everything builds from there. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move from that, which is imperative or procedural programming into this idea of object oriented programming and how C++ uses libraries or you can build classes to be able to structure data in the way that you see fit in order to make your program work best. So it's the best way to understand this is to work from the ground up and to be able to see how your program works at different levels of abstraction. So here, this information that I have, I have the links for the course syllabus, uh, the lecture notes. I also have a Slack channel. I sent out an email a couple of days ago. If you can't get into the Slack channel, shoot me an email and I will add you. And also a few of you have already uh, found me on there. I have a LinkedIn page. I'm happy to connect. I regularly post job opportunities and inter internship opportunities to try to give you an opportunity to uh, um, expand your job prospects. Lecture will be in here at 1245 to 2 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday. I will, and I'm broadcasting it right now on the Zoom. If for some reason you feel ill or you don't feel comfortable going outside, you are welcome to attend via Zoom. You may, the, the only thing we got to work on is making sure that uh, there's appropriate things for the midterm and final exam. Otherwise, you do not have to ask my permission. You just watch on the Zoom. Furthermore, I record all the lectures. I'm going to be posting them to YouTube. Uh, for those of you who've already seen the lecture schedule, you'll see I have uh, everything for every lecture YouTube link available after class. And you have the ability, if for some reason you can't attend at the particular time, to go back and watch as well. So in the event that we have some sort of disruption like we did last semester, uh, we will uh, continue to hold lecture on Zoom. Okay, so these are my office hours, uh, Monday, one to two, Tuesday and Wednesday, 10.30 a.m. to 12. I hold uh, Zoom only office hours on Wednesday and Thursday afternoons. And the reason I do that is because the coding challenges will be due every Thursday at midnight. And therefore I want students to have the opportunity to be able to ask me questions. As you'll see when you get, uh, when you get to the office hours for the teaching assistants, there are huge blocks of office hours on Wednesdays and Thursday nights. 
So that way you have this good opportunity to be able to ask questions and be able to progress on those and do well on the assignments. All right, so quick announcement regarding the lab. So we just created, so there was a little bit of scheduling drama and what we're trying to do to work with it is that there is a new section six, that's a Monday from 2.30 to 3.30. And the uh, sections one and two are still at the same times and pushing 303. We have to move sections three, four, and five to the Bartolo 228. Uh, that's something that was just worked out this morning. Uh, Ramsey sent out a couple emails, so I want to make sure that I announced it here as well. Um, you are, you, so if you want to move over, uh, in order to meet the spacing requirements, we actually need four students from section three and one student from section four to move. But my understanding is that the Monday sections are more coveted. So therefore, if you want to try to register for those, the first come first serve basis. Furthermore, um, I will be having a Zoom room. You are welcome to attend any lab section you like via Zoom. TAs will be attending via Zoom and you'll make a breakout room to present your lab work and therefore you can attend. But if you wanna attend in person, you have to attend in the lab section that uh, you are registered for. Right, does anybody have any questions about this before I uh, go on? All right. So this is the grading breakdown. Uh, the, my grade is broken down into five parts. There are in-class assignments, which I'll describe in a moment. There are laboratory assignments. And both of those are building up to the coding challenges. There'll be eight of those throughout the first part of the uh, semester. And then the last part of the semester, we're working on uh, the pre-turnship project. And the pre-turnship project is a final group project where you'll actually be working with an industry mentor to build a a uh, large project. Then there's the midterm and the final exam. And what I have here at the bottom is this idea of upward grade adjustment. So what I can do is in the event that, you know, you're really close, like your borderline A, A minus, A minus B plus, something like that. Um, I, by saying that I reserve the right to be able to move your grade up if I feel that's appropriate. I have one rule though. The rule is I will only provide that for students who have a 90% or higher on the in-class assignments. The thing is for the in-class assignments, you'll work on a problem and then I'm gonna present the solution and we'll discuss the process. So if you attend lecture and submit them on time, you should have no problem getting a 100%. Okay, so the in-class assignments. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna discuss a concept and then allow you to work on our one or two problems. Uh, each lecture should have about six or seven total where you're actually gonna get the opportunity to see if you understand what the concept is. You'll actually work on a problem. and It'll be very similar to the type of problem that I will ask on an exam. You'll, under, you'll demonstrate that you understand it. You'll learn if you make a mistake in a low risk environment and you'll understand how I ask questions on the exam so that way it ensures fairness. And furthermore, one of the benefits is, I believe that the best way to learn data structures material should be trying to think through it. I don't want you to feel like you have to like constantly guess in my lecture about what, thing, what notes to write down. And so to emphasize that, not only will I go over the answer in class, but I'm also gonna have a link, which is a midterm review, and we'll have the problem and I'll have a short video where I describe the solution as well. And that will actually be building up the midterm and final reviews for you. So what I want you to do is kind of more thinking through the process, trying to visualize the data structure, how it's operating, and then apply that understanding. So that's why that's my objective with the in-class assignments. So out of class expectation. So with data structures, this course is unique in that with the exception of fundamentals of computing, it's a prerequisite for every single required and elective course in the curriculum. Furthermore, and I'm sure many of you know this already, that this is the course that industry really starts to expect you to understand when you start applying for jobs. As a result, the expectations can be a little higher than their normal class that you might've had up to this point. So the rule that I've come up with is that a good uh, amount of work outside of class per week is on average eight hours. 
if you go too far below eight hours, you don't meet the intellectual rigor that is expected from industry or degree accreditation boards to make your degree valuable. If I go too far above eight hours, then that starts eating into your time for other classes, your time to actually be able to relax and do other activities. So that's kind of the goal that I have there to make sure that I'm working that balance. And I've included uh, this quote from the Holy uh, Cross that is also mentioned to Notre Dame students that the mind will not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. So I know that I have to provide an intellectually rigorous course, but I want you to make sure that you understand that I'm gonna work with you and the TAs are gonna work with you to make sure that you all succeed. So on that point, this is the uh, bell curve from the SIF from last semester students and it came out almost exactly the same, it was 8.06. So the million dollar question that some of you might be thinking, right, is well, what happens if I'm on the wrong side of the bell curve? What happens if you're really struggling, you're taking 14, 15 hours a week, you're pulling your hair out, you're really frustrated. First and foremost, I want to say that does not mean you're a bad programmer and you should drop out of computer science or computer engineering. But it's an opportunity for us to be able to intervene and work with you. I want to give you an example of a student from last semester, uh, Gabriel Quintero, who about at the, I want to say about the 40% mark of the course is actually failing. And he was taking an incredible amount of time on the assignment. And he came in and he was telling me this when I was going through his process. And the recommendation I made to him is come to office hours, ask questions, do these kind of things, and identify when the moment you get stuck, find me, find a teaching assistant. And from then on, I could count on every single time I opened the door to start office hours, he'd be waiting outside, waiting for us. And so I've included this note because I consider it a success story because he actually brought his grades up to a B plus. It was really impressive. So I want to root through this note that he said, because I asked him to make this kind of thing for you to kind of motivate you as you're working through this. He says, halfway through the semester, I started going to office hours after Dr. Morrison recommended. I was a bit hesitant about doing this because I thought this meant I wasn't smart enough to solely learn from the lectures. However, after going to office hours, I was finishing my assignments more quickly, saved our four hours per week. Yes, I measured it. Understanding the material with more depth, I was realized that answering the questions that sparked my curiosity made my learning more effective. Additionally, I started making sleep a priority. This also did wonders for all my classes. At first, my grades suffered a lot, but then I started recovering. I started doing well in this class once I realized that everything on its own is a resource for learning, including the assignments. I wasn't gonna get a job just because I solved the assignments on my own. It's not like you're about to get your job offer at your dream company and I'm just gonna hop out up from behind no one and go, oh, you didn't do coding challenge three the first time without help, we can't get hired. You know? I'm not going to do anything like that. I wasn't just going to get, oh yeah, uh, thus I swallowed my intellectual pride and used the assignments as tools to fill my knowledge gaps. I had to ask questions without fear of looking like an idiot in front of Dr. Morrison and the other students. Trust me, we're all not judging. We all want to be here to help. The first few times it was hard, but after seeing how much this impacted my grade, my learning, I lost fear. So this, I want to take this last thing. This is great advice, especially as the semester starts uh, uh, getting a little more stressful. If your semester is catching on fire, ask tons of questions, focus on satiating your curiosity and your grade will reflect it and sleep as much as you can. So he's true when he says this, that I really care about helping the students and making your work efficient. Both of these things should help you maintain good performance without impacting your grade and mental health. So for example, on coding challenge one, they are officially assigned on a Wednesday and then they're due the following Thursday. So there's eight days. And for an example, um, I have, let me click, click, click on this link here to show you. And what I've included, once it comes up, I'll show you, I'll click on it, is I've included a sample link on how to plan out working on a coding project. As you get further into your coding career, what you're going to see is that it, you become a much more effective programmer when you're doing most of the work before you write a single line of code. And so, uh, no, I do not want to recover graph. And so here I have example schedule and plan for, and I have written out like a certain amount of time. And more importantly, I have benchmarks where if you don't understand it, go find us in the office and ask some questions. So did you have your hand up in the back there? No, okay. So I just wanna show you this. Um, 
but I also have what I call the Jodon rule. Jodon is a uh, is an Army Ranger friend of mine back in Mississippi, and he uh, said, "Bad news thinks worse with age. If you are proactive about getting help, I promise it will significantly cut down the amount of time that you need to do work." Okay, so does anybody have any questions about the out of class? Any comments? Anything like that? Before I continue. The other thing I'm going to do is I'll occasionally check the chat just to make sure. Okay. All right, so a couple quick things on submission and late policies. All right, so generally for the coding assignments or the labs, um, it's a 20% deduction for each day that is late. However, I have what are called self-service extensions. And you get two of them for, uh, for out of the eight coding challenges. And what it is, is that you can ex ex request a one day extension on an assignment with no penalty. My only rule is that you have to ask wait, no later than 24 hours before the assignment is due. So the objective here is to reward prior proper planning on an assignment. But if you do that, and I have the times for each assignment about when a self-service extension would be due, if you do that, you can get a full 24 hours. And the objective is to consider when life gets in the way, another assignment took longer than you expected, you have a big exam, I wanna make sure that we're accounting for this appropriately. Furthermore, um, if you are sick or something comes up, life happens, uh, you contact with me, I, I'm happy to work with you and you won't have to use a self-service extension on that. A quick uh, academic dishonesty spiel. So, Short version, don't cheat. So the question is, what actually is cheating in computer science? This can be a tough, uh, it can be hard to understand the first time you're going through, so I wanna give you a quick spiel on it. There's a difference between resources and solutions. So if you see something that describes an algorithm on Wikipedia, that's fine if you cite it, but if you actually go on geeks for geeks and copy code, even if it's only part of it, that's generally a bad idea. The whole goal is you should have what you submit should be what came out of your mind. So if you're talking to one of your classmates, it shouldn't be like, okay, well, here's my exact code. But if I talk to my classmate and now I understand something better because of it, and I'm able to now solve the problem because I understand it better, that's perfectly fine. So here's a good rule that I like to follow. I call it the did I cheat myself rule. The whole goal of any of these assignments and these concepts is so that you understand the principles and can implement them after graduation. The, you know, it, it's, it's, I like to think that my class is important, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not. But if you can take those skills and build upon them on your own, that's what truly makes this worthwhile. So the did I cheat myself rule is if you look back at your code, or if I were to look at a code you submitted, I said, can you tell me what this code does and you can't do it, then you cheated yourself. And the crucial thing is that when you cheat, you do something like that, the person you're hurting your most, you're cheating the most is yourself. Because you don't want to put yourself in those positions where you think you understand something and then you hit a real world situation and you don't. I like to cite uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, who said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So what happens when you graduate and some of the answers online? The one thing I want you to take away from this first lecture is that the idea of data structures is that you're learning how to apply different structuring principles to learn how to overcome adversity. What happens when your first approach doesn't work? Should I use a hash table? Should I use a tree? You know, should I use a graph? What, what kind of concept, speed, memory, all these things contribute. And if something doesn't work the first time or isn't, doesn't meet appropriate benchmarks, you can use your knowledge of data structures to think, okay, instead of panicking, I can think this through, oh, that's right, maybe I should use a hash map, that'll improve speed. Or, oh, I'm using way too much memory. The hash maps take up too much memory. I can significantly reduce memory and get good enough access with a red black tree, for example. So if you're taking that kind of stuff and you're approaching your course that way, it will really only help you once you graduate. All right, so quick uh, overview of the important dates for the semester. Um, the first mini break is March 2nd. So the university is imposing two mini breaks. Uh, one is gonna be March 2nd is a Tuesday. 
And so there's no classes and we are directed. We cannot assign anything. We can't hold office hours. That is your day to relax. Because of there's the labs on Monday and Tuesday have also canceled the Monday lab as well. So those two labs offer are canceled for the mini break. I also do a quarter term SIF. I'm gonna be doing that on Friday, March 5th. And it gives me a good idea of how the class is coming along, how you're feeling, and I can make appropriate tweaks to the class if I, there's something prescriptive that I can do to improve the student experience. Then the midterm exam is on Tuesday, March 23rd. The second mini break is April 21st, so I'm also canceling the labs for that week as well. And then uh, last in-class lectures, May the 11th on the Tuesday, the final pre-turnship deliverables, you'll understand a lot more about what I mean by that later or that final week. And then the final exam tentatively is Monday at 10.30 a.m. on May 17th here. Right, so uh, for those of you who need to talk to me about Sarah B, uh, that link is available for you to be able to take care of all that. And the other crucial thing, and I know I've been emphasizing this idea that we're trying to make the course efficient, is that no assignment that I have is worth compromising your mental health. So if you're struggling with something, please do not hesitate. I won't shame you. There have been times when a student's been really struggling where I've actually just called the Sarah B Center as like, can you give me permission to give the student an extension or get them the help they need? I'm happy to help you. All right, so what is the, one of the goals of this data structures course? So up to this point, you've done a lot of programming. In previous courses, you've coded in C, maybe you have a little experience with C++, and you've learned, okay, I write something and the code does something else. And basically, think of data structures as a function where before you are just a programmer, and when I say just a programmer, I mean, you're not implementing mathematical and physical understanding of certain principles. And by the time you're done, you're a computer scientist. So my goal is that by the end of this course, I will look at you as a peer. And that's an awesome thing, especially at the sophomore level. I think that's one of the best things about our field. So the whole goal, and this is more from the course description, is that you're gonna be learning about imperative and object-oriented programming and data structures. So you learned a lot about procedural programming in fundamentals, memory management, pointers, being able to make functions and kind of run them through the computer. So you will learn this, but you'll see this and how it contributes to putting memory on the instruction memory and the data stack. You're gonna learn a lot about that in this course and how to make that efficient and reliable. And then we're gonna learn about object-oriented programming, which is actually a different kind of philosophy as opposed to C. So C++, we build classes, we build them as objects. And the goal is to treat these objects interacting as you would do in the real world. So for example, human sits in chair, you know, dogs want pets. Uh, there's certain kinds of things that objects do that we might not necessarily be able to represent in a normal procedural language. And from there, we're gonna learn about the design and use of elementary data structures and how to have them be implemented effectively. So by the end of the semester, here is what we expect you to be able to do. So to be able to demonstrate understanding of and proficiency in use of C++ and object-oriented concepts, including data hiding, which is gonna be really important to protect security and reliability of data. Inheritance, so very briefly on inheritance, you know, everybody in here is a person, except for one, only one, one dog, but then there's categories. We have Irish, everybody's a member of the Notre Dame community, but then you are Notre Dame students, I am a Notre Dame faculty. And then based on these inheritance, we can do different things in many forms, that's called polymorphism. So learn about these concepts in this course. Next, you learn about analyzing performance. So we're gonna talk about things such as amortized analysis, big O notation, um, something, the big O notation is something you'll hit in a lot more for those of you who are taking discrete math this semester. Uh, but the idea is how can I measure with reasonable accuracy the worst case scenario for this particular program? And we're gonna use that to be able to select the right fit for any situation. What does the customer want? How do we use this to be able to meet that requirement? 
And then finally, applying these data structures in real world application, employing abstractions to make them work together cleanly and safely. Okay, so when I say that computer science is also an art form, and when I say it's a type of abstraction, one thing I want you to think about is that they work on different levels, just like in a painting. So here we have the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa, at the surface, we just have a picture. But there's all kinds of things that go into a painting. You have different co colors of paint, you have different thicknesses, you have different brushes, you have different types of canvases, and somebody who is really good at painting can take advantage of that in a way that has them interact and that comes up with an outstanding painting. And you can see this example here. So a computer scientist is able to do the same with hardware and software together. And that's a big thing about data structures is, okay, I'm writing a piece of code. How does this impact it when I put it in the hardware and how can I take advantage of that knowledge to make the program run well? So uh, this is Donald Knuth. I was about to ask if anybody could tell me who that is, but his name's in big letters up there. So Donald Knuth uh, is often called the Yoda of computer programming. And he wrote this book called The Art of Computer Programming that started out in the 1950s and 60s. And he is a professor emeritus at Stanford now. And when he wrote this book, he actually stated, this is not an introductory text, and that you needed to know memory, registers, bits, floating point, and overflow in order to be able to do this. And back then when computers were half the size of this room, you had to be able to write four programs on one computer. And then he started the book with the exact material that we're gonna start learning in this class. But now, you know, if I mentioned some of those terms, registers, bits, floating points, some of you they say, well, I've been doing programming for a long time, and I have no idea what you were just talking about. And that's okay. That's what we're going to start the course out at. We want to emphasize these levels of abstraction to be able to work on. So I have this quote comment on there about modern software kind of abstracts the complexity, because we want new programmers to be able to start working it from the bottom up. They say, okay, I can work on, I can write a little bit of code. It does something awesome, and it feels good, and it makes you want to continue working in it. But now we got to dig deeper in order to make the code good. So from the levels of abstraction, learning how to make hardware and software interact is one of the great joys, but also one of the great challenges, which is one of the reasons why this particular course is considered so be so important you know, in, in competing for industry positions. So I have this quick note, if you're intimidated by this, don't worry, we're gonna work with you. We all want you to uh, do really well. I almost said uh, a different term, but I don't wanna be uh, hugging in front of class. Um, but you're not alone and you have the potential to be an outstanding programmer. Okay, so before I go into levels of abstraction, does anybody have any questions? All right, so first I'm gonna go through the list of the levels of abstraction that you'll need to understand to do well in this class and how a computer actually works. So the first one is this idea of pointers. And this, oh, I went too fast, sorry. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a piece of code that many of you, if you coded in C++, you're gonna be familiar with. And I'm gonna make a claim that this code contains two pointers. And it might not look that way. So this is actually just hello world in C++. You have what's known as standard C out. For those of you who are not familiar with standard C out is an object oriented version of printf or fprintf. And then I have hello world and then standard end line. That is just puts a backslash n in the line of code. So by the end of this lecture, I'm gonna give you an example of why this is actually contains two pointers. And when you start to be able to see code like that at different levels of abstraction, you'll be able to implement and master C++ in a better way. So the first level is a physical level. And we're not gonna go into that at all in this course. That's transistors, that's silicon, that type of level. So that's something if you wanna take a CMOS course to understand how to fabricate computer chips, that's what's really going on at that level. Level two is logical level. And you're gonna learn a lot about that level in logic design if you haven't taken that class already. If you're taking it this semester, 
where you're taking the labs this semester, you're gonna learn a lot about the implementation of, of the logical level. So let me go to the next slide and show you logic level. So logical level is things like creating arithmetic logically, being able to make, take that physical level and turn into things like AND gates and OR gates, which you're able to make decisions. And what I have here, this is a one bit arithmetic logic unit where I have two inputs and what are known as select inputs. And what those select inputs do is they say, all right, I'm gonna calculate and or addition, subtraction. And based on these selections, you're gonna select which one goes on the input of a multiplexer. Now that's really deep down, but what help that's gonna help you do is help you understand this idea of a finite state machine. Finite state machine is you start a specific state and then the user gives you a specific input. And then based on that input, you move to another input. And then you keep doing that. And that's a way of simplifying a program and being able to make it uh, more effective. And so that's kind of one of these ideas of the logical level. Another thing that I have over here at the logical level is this glut of zeros and ones. And I've broken them down into three pieces. And this is what's known as a floating point value. So if you've ever coded a float, what's actually going on there is that is representing a level of precision. So for example, I know from the IEEE 754 standard that that one at the front means it's a negative number. And then I can plug this into a particular equation and I can actually get a specific decimal point and a specific exponent. And having the computer, the computing device structure the data in a specific way, we can come up with a level of accuracy. So integers are, are accurate because one is always gonna be equal to one. But if you put in 2.2 and subtract minus 0.1, in our heads, we know that's 2.1, but in a computing device, it's only a certain level of precise, and that makes it hard to be able to make certain decisions, like loops. That's why you typically want to use uh, integer values in a loop, because that can give you an exact value. So understanding the, how even something like a float is structured becomes really important to be able to implement algorithms. And I'm actually going to show you an example later this semester of the Ariane 5 space rocket where improper structuring of floating led to a catastrophe. So this is the idea of the second level of abstraction at the logical level. There we go. So the next level, we come up a little more and we go to this idea of the architectural level. Now at the, in the computer architecture course, you'll go into a lot more detail about the design and implementation of computer architecture. What I want you to take from this class is just enough to understand what a pointer is, how it works with the instruction memory, and how it works with the data heap. Because a pointer pointing to the data heap is going to be a huge portion of how data structures work in the memory. And if you understand that, what's going to end up happening is that you'll more you'll understand the computing efficiency, you'll understand the big O runtime. You may even, you always understand what's known as a moratized analysis, which is you will have an occasional operation which takes a long time, but by doing that long-term operation, it will actually significantly reduce the time of all of the other operations that that particular data structure implements. So the general idea behind a computer architecture is that you have some sort of input device or you have input code. So for those of you who've coded in C, Arg, int arg c char star star arg d. That tells me what I need to put in the input, and I know how many command uh, values I have on the input, and I also know how to attain all of them. What we're going to learn is this char star star is actually just pointers to different locations in the data memory. And that's what's going on here. So we'll learn how this contains what's known as the stack, and we'll learn about how this contains the heap. From there, we have registers, fast, efficient, and reliable. The difference is when you turn the computer off, they're volatile, which means that the power goes off, they don't save the information. And also the control memory. So the control unit sends information 
to all of the other elements in the computer architecture. So for example, I'm gonna, if I wanna do something called a load and then a add and then a store, that's the fundamental of what a pointer actually is. And the com control unit helps me be able to dictate what all that is. So in a control unit, if you understand that, that's actually gonna be helpful when you take your theory of computing course later and you start learning about Turing machines. The arithmetic logic unit, I was just describing that in the uh, logical level of abstraction. A pointer is actually an addition. And we're gonna learn about how the additions contribute to actually putting things into that data memory or accessing them and then putting them into the, putting them into the register for fast things. Good thing we got all that brand new duct tape. I don't know what's going on out there. And then at the end, we eventually want to have something on an output device. So a very simple version of a Turing machine, the Turing thought experiment, you had somebody put in a bunch of zeros and ones. There's a person in a box that does a set of operations and then puts them out on the output. And the person on the output can interpret what the computer actually does. And so that's what's actually going on when you run a program and you execute it eventually you need to have the computing device output the result in a way in which we can interpret. So that becomes really important when you start learning about representation of characters, you know, ASCII values. All right, does anybody have any questions about this before I continue? All right, so building up from there, there are several different leverage, uh, levels to programming languages. The first level is known as assembly language. An assembly language is actually mapping to the computer architecture. So I don't expect you to uh, actually replicate this on an exam for now, but you'll do something like this in computer architecture. What this line of code means is that I'm going to take something from the data memory and put it in a local register. Next, I want to add the value to that register. In this case, I'm adding 36. And then SW means I'm gonna take that final result and put it in data memory. Now, I don't expect you to be able to do that, but that is the fundamental of what passed by reference is. You have a pointer, you dereference the pointer. Sorry about that. Um, you, have a, you take it out of the memory, you perform some sort of fast operation on it, and then, you take it back and that's how dereferencing a pointer works. And so we'll understand that and we'll implement this by learning about void pointers. So you don't need to know this now, but the crucial thing is that there's something going on underneath. When you write that code, it sends information and it's all interpreted by this physical computer architecture. So if you understand how a pointer works and what's actually going on, it'll make your code more efficient. All right, so now we get to procedural programming. Procedural programming is, it's at a higher level than assembly language, but the whole idea is that you are telling the computer precisely what to do. So for example, this is a hello world program in C. And the difference here is you have some standard output, so that's the terminal. And then what you're actually doing here is you're allocating memory on the data key and you're saying, I need to allocate some memory and it has to contain characters that represent hello world. And then you will print these to that output. So we tell the computer, create a register that is pointing to a location in the data memory. The data memory contains binary representations of characters that represent hello world and then we have to somehow access them and print them to the output. So you can see this idea of procedure. It's working through and you're thinking, the, you're telling the computer exactly what to do. And so some people, particularly, you know, I'm a computer engineer by trade. So a lot of people are computer engineers who really like to deal with the lower level programming. They really enjoy coding at the C level. 
And C++ or object oriented programming is a little different. I see some people scribbling down notes. Does anybody? I'm, uh, I'll wait for a split second. Oh, you, you don't have to stop on my behalf. Um, does anybody have any questions before I hop on to object oriented programming? So I do that. If I see people still scribbling down, I'll hesitate for a moment to let everybody catch up. This code that I showed you before that I claimed has two pointers is object oriented. Standard C out does tells me where the output is, but it's also what's known as an object. It treats hello world as some sort of object. In the C version, I had to indicate with an output specifier this percent s means there was a string. What we're gonna be able to do in C++ is I could put an integer here, I could put a float there, I could put a string there. I, and C++ will treat it as an object and will take in anything, any type of object. And that process is known as genericity, where you can do something generically. And so here we put in a string and the object says, okay, it's a string, I'll do the work for you. So it's a higher level than procedural programming. And the objective of object-oriented programming, I mentioned this a little earlier, is to have things work as though they're real world type objects and to abstract some of the complexity away from the program. So one of the important things about data structures course is making this transition from procedural programming in C to object-oriented programming. So now at the algorithmic level, we're gonna go into a few types of algorithms in this course. We'll go into things like divide and conquer. We'll learn some sorting algorithms. We're gonna go into a lot more detail about recursion and something specifically called memoization, which allows us to be able to do recursion a lot faster. We'll learn about hashing in order to be able to do seed and then dynamic programming, which is a way of taking previously calculated solutions to be able to develop a new solution. So for example, the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence, we have the first two numbers are one and one, and then you just add the last two numbers. So one and one becomes two, then it's two and one becomes three, three and two becomes five, five, uh, five and three becomes eight and so on. So what you're just doing is taking recently calculated results to develop the new result. So you, what you don't have to do is you don't have to go at every single time recalculate everything. So taking advantage of data structures and this kind of algorithmic approach will make your code run more efficiently. And so there are trade-offs. So hash tables, you can access them in what's known as bagel of one time. So this is constant. Every single time we do that is constant. However, in order to do that, we have to implement a lot more memory, which means we have to implement more memory on the, da memory on the data stack. So there's trade-offs to these different approaches and understanding all of that all the way from the logical level all the way up to this algorithmic level will really strengthen your approach as you become a programmer, computer scientist, computer engineer, or whatever it is that you plan on doing with what you learn in this class. I'm sorry, did you have a question in the back? No? All right, so based on this discussion, what I want to do is I want to build a definition of data structure. I will not ask you to replicate this on an exam, but I want to kind of work through it and see if what I've been talking about so far makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, please do not hesitate to ask any questions. Okay, so defining data structures in the context of levels of abstraction. First, I want to say that a data structure is a method for collection and storage of logical data value in a computing device. So we saw one such example with Hello World. The data is characters. I have a certain amount of characters and I need to collect them and store them somehow. And I also need to be eventually need to be able to access it. So I need to be able to know how to do it efficiently. I know how to be able to do it reliably. And then I need to somehow go through and be able to get that because in Hello World, that eventually goes to printing the output to the terminal. Does that make sense so far? I'm gonna give everybody a moment to jot that down. So let me repeat that for you. The first part is a data structure is a method for collection and storage of logical data values in a computing device. 
while you're all running that down, I'll check to see if there are any questions in the chat. So for those of you who are online, I will regularly check the chat. So if you want to ask any questions, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. I will check that and I'll address your questions in real time. Okay, it seems as though everybody's in line. So that's the first part. Second portion, and associated approaches for performing operations on those values and collections. So we're gonna learn things about how to insert into, for example, a binary search tree. How do I find the right place to put it? How do I connect one node to another using a pointer? How would I go about doing this? What's the most effective way? And what am I doing, if I'm doing dynamic arrays, which for those of you putting C++ are vectors, how do I ensure that I can reallocate memory without unintentionally overwriting other memory pieces? In hash tables, we're not gonna be able to just delete. We're gonna do something called lazy deletion. And later in the semester, that will make a lot more sense. But in general, we have to say, okay, well, if I actually delete an element from the hash table, that screws up some of my algorithms to be able to seek and find those values. So we have to bear all of those things in mind. So the second part of the definition and associated approaches for performing operations on those values and collections. Okay, and now the last part that progress efficiently through the machine. That's where we're going to start tying in this algorithms portion. If I want to reduce memory consumption, but I still need to have some sort of relatively fast access time, a binary search tree is a good choice. Hash tables what, or access faster, but consume more memory. Trees consume less memory, but are not uh, as fast access. If your customers, like, if, for example, if let's say a uh, per perfect uh, NASA, right? So NASA, when you're putting an embedded system onto one of the Mars rovers, weight is a premium, which means you have to be as efficient with the computer as possible. You can't be like ask for a larger memory chip because we have to be very efficient with it. Also, we don't want to have a segmentation fault on Mars because we can't just send somebody out to just reboot the computer, right? We're literally millions of miles away. So we have to be efficient and reliable. So we have to think about good trade-offs and being able to run, you know, reliably. Reliability is very important. Low memory is very important. Speed is not as important because even though it's going to do something, it's still going to send it back millions of miles away and it's going to move the large, the large rover is going to move only a few feet at a time. So speed is not as important as memory. So you're going to make those kind of choices based on what the customer wants, what is required for your specific environment. So I'm going to read through the definition one last time based on the levels of abstraction. A data structure is a method for collection and storage of logical data values in a computer device. So that's a logical level and the architectural level and associated approaches for performing operations on those values and conditions. So now we're talking about procedural and object-oriented level. And then we have the last part of the definition that progresses efficiently through the machine. So now that's your algorithmic level. Does anybody have any questions about that? Not even Erin, that's impressive. She really knows her stuff. All right, so some of you may know C++, a few couple of you may not. So we're going to say reintroduction to C++. So this picture here is of Bjarne Straustrup, and he is the inventor of C++. So in 1979, he, for his dissertation, he invented a language called C with classes. And with C++, he, it wasn't like coding. For him, it was a philosophy. So he says, I find Kierkegaard's almost fanatical concern for the individual and keen psychological insights much more appealing than the grandiose schemes and concerns 
for humanity in the abstract of Hegel or Marx. And what he means by that, he said, C, many C++ design choices have their root in his dislike for forcing people to do things in a specific way. So this procedural programming, F for an F, I have to do this I, percent S, I have to do the output specifier, which tells the computing device how to put elements in the data memory. Then I have to do that. It's very procedural. It does things in a very specific way. What he wants to do is he wants to say where ideals clash and sometimes even when pundits seem to agree, I prefer to provide support that gives the programmer a choice. Generosity, being able to write a data structure that can store integer characters, strings, a class that you create. That's the goal of C++ and object oriented programming. So he changes the name to C++ and the goal is to enable professional programmers to write real world programs that simultaneously elegant and efficient. So if that's a philosophy I want you to take away in terms of what data structures is, elegant and efficient. Is the code efficient? Can it be, is it easy to interpret? Is it easy for other people to use? So he wants to, his quote here is to raise the level of abstraction. So he's gone from procedural to object oriented programming. I had that uh, quote in red there about ideologically limited. The reason I have that highlighted and I present it in data structures is that transition from C to C++. And if you're kind of having an initial hard time kind of visualizing and understanding C++, that's perfectly okay. It's a different type of philosophy. As, okay, so moving from C to C++, this idea of object-oriented programming of being able to take objects and put them into code has four main pillars. One is encapsulation. This, for those of you who take the code in C++, if you, uh, let me ask you a quick question. If those of you take, took fundamentals with Dr. Duong, do you all cover classes at all? No, okay. So th the idea of a class is I could say class person. And I'll actually go into more detail about this in, in future slides. I can say, a person has these specific characteristics and I can perform these specific operations. When I define a class, I can encapsulate that. So every single time I define person, it has those specific characteristics. Second is abstraction, hiding procedural complexity. One of the goals, if you build a really good class and you build a really good data structure, it should be really easy to implement it. The more complicated the data structure, the simpler the algorithm. If it's easy for someone to use your code, it's well abstracted. They only have to write, um, call a function, it, a call a class method that's the equivalent of a function in the class. And it does something that makes them happy. They don't have to deal with what's going on underneath the hood. That's good abstraction. So inheritance is the next one. Inheritance means that certain different, uh, certain classes have the same common principles. So everybody who's at Notre Dame, whether they're faculty, staff, or a student, they all come here, we all have IDs, we all have uh, parking, or you know, there's certain things that every single Notre Dame in person has. But then you get the students. Students have a dorm. Faculty like me have no business over there. So I don't need anything involving a dorm. I need to have where our, my house is, right? And then I have information about what kind of uh, you know, salaries, things like that. You have things like GPA. When you have different types of the same fundamental object, that's known as polymorphism. Okay, so let me go over an example of this idea of object encapsulation. The world is full of objects. Let's say I had a glass of water, a computer gear, and some desks and pencils. I know what will happen if I turn the glass of water over. And I also know what would happen if water hits glass. So the idea of object-oriented programming is I should be able to write code that outputs a method, spills water, and has it operate well with the computer hit with water, where I don't have to actually write another bit important large code that has to somehow tell them how to interact. 
So that's one of the goals of object-oriented programming, to use the code in unanticipated ways. And one of the reasons why we want to structure data in a specific way is to make those unanticipated ways work efficiently and reliably. So here I have an encapsulation. So object functions are known as methods and object value variables are known as properties. So I'm gonna show you an example here in a moment. So as a student, you had your Notre Dame ID, you have your name and you have a GPA. These are all properties within a class. And I wanna have methods that operate on them. So for example, register. Register, I wanna put in some sort of inputs and that checks to see whether or not you can register for a class. So for example, those of you who want to move to Monday's lab, one of the things that you might want to do is check to make sure you're not registered for another class, or we have to check to make sure that it's not full. So that's the type of method that can be operated upon a class student. And then we have these private numbers or properties. So, so that way, in, when we access the class. So for example, let's say one of the properties is social security number. You need to have that in there, but only needs to be accessed at certain times. Not everybody who's accessing the program needs to know your social security number. There's no good reason for me to know your social security number. So therefore there should be no program that I can run or code that would allow me to access it. So that is this idea of encapsulation. Does anybody have any questions before I go on into abstract? Okay, so we want to build programs that are easy for the user, but we want to check other requirements. I think actually now we have other methods that we're going to say are private methods. So when I say this abstraction, you would put in a specific class that you want to register for. You want to register for this new section six for the lab. There's certain things that need to be checked and we don't, you, you know, we have to check to see if you meet the prerequisites for the course. Have you passed fundamentals of computing? The thing is you don't, when you're using the code, you want to have to click through everything. Okay, have you done this? Yes, have you done this? Yes, right? That's obnoxious. A well-written program abstracts unnecessary details away from the program. So when I say, have I met the prerequisites, it can check the student uh, properties to see if he's met some for you. And we're gonna have a method there that's private. Number of seats, are there seats available in that class? And credit overload, if there's a limit on the number of credits you can take in a semester, are you exceeding it? So for example, let's say you unintentionally exceed it if you're in section five, and you're somehow registered for both, they'll say, wait a minute, you can't do that because you're now at 21 credits or whatever it is. So that would remind you to get out of one section before going back into another. And hiding this procedural complexity away from the programmer is known as abstraction, which is a very important aspect of data structure. So for registration, there's different types of registration for different classes, for freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. You could actually have a class sophomore that inherits fundamental properties from students, but makes different methods for a specific sophomore. So for example, freshmen, you have to register for the first year of study. Sophomores, you set your major, and then senior, you can apply to graduate. So these are different things, but build off of the same fundamental class student. So you inherit those fundamental properties, but then you can build upon those. And that is known as inheritance. And we're gonna show you several examples of a data structure that actually inherits from a different data structure. So we're gonna learn about different types of hash tables. We're gonna learn about AVL trees. We're gonna learn about splay trees. And the objective there is to say, well, I've already written all that previous code. If I can, in everything that I need there, I need this for this other prop, uh, program instead of just rewriting or copying all this code previously, I can say that in this class inherits that class and then I'll make modifications based on it. So the objective that you should take from that is how to avoid doing redundant, unnecessary work. 
And so here's a, I, I've kind of alluded to this, but here's an animation to show you. So an undergraduate student is a student. Then a student is a member of the Notre Dame community. And an under, so therefore, an undergraduate student is a member of the Notre Dame community. And when we go over inheritance, I'm going to talk about, uh, there's a reason I have is a highlighted, because you're going to go into a lot of detail about is a professor is a member of the Notre Dame community. A student is a member of the Notre Dame community. A professor is not living in Dillon Hall. Okay. These are how you can separate what should be and should not be done in inheritance. Right, so uh, quick, I want to check to see if anybody has any questions before I quickly review polymorphism. All right, so polymorphism, you can say, you can have a different version of the same method. So for example, let's say that I have two classes, I say four classes, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and all of them have a method registered. We want to register for classes. But we want to have them be, have the student be able to register at different times. So freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors can register on different days. So we don't want a freshman to be able to register at a senior time. So what we can do is we can write a different version of register in the senior class, the sophomore class, the junior class, or the freshman class. So that way we want them to do exactly what we want uh, and make sure that the students can register at the appropriate time. So we have the same method, but it has different forms in different inherited classes. So that uh, polymorphism, that's the Greek, in English, that stands for many forms. A quick note about C and C++. So at C++ or C, depending on which one you think is better, it's more of a debate of philosophy, not coding. As such, you get some passionate and pointed responses about which one is better. So I've included some quotes from some of the main contributors. So Ken Thompson um, was a fundamental contributor to C and the Unix operating language. And he didn't like C++ very much. And he said, uh, if Alan Turing, who's one of the, is the inventor of the modern computing device, he said, if the Alan Turing saw C++, it would be like if the inventor of the TV came back and watched Mori Povich. So he was saying, you are not the father guy, right? So, the modern analogy in 2021 would be if the uh, better the TV came back alive and saw Tiger King and saw Carol Baskin acting the fool on television, right? So, okay. Furthermore, you have Linus Torvalds who invented Linux. He just straight up says C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it. So then Bjarne Straustrup comes back he claps back, so to speak, and he says, C++ is designed to allow you to express ideas. But if you don't have ideas or don't know, have a clue about how to express them, C++ doesn't offer much help. So in that debate, there's a lot of shade going on between them, right? So why do I mention this? You know, we're teaching this class in C++, and why would I come up, oh, C++, it's a substandard programming language. A lot of substandard programmers use it. Do well in my class, right? We don't want to do things like that. We want to set some good expectations. Some of you have really will have really enjoyed C because procedural is natural to you. For some of you, that was ideologically limiting. Or at C++, it's the other way around. C++ is like, oh, why can't this just do it in the way that I'm thinking? And then you start coding in C++, it'll make a lot more sense to you. And both of those reactions are okay. You can still be an outstanding programmer. There's no reason for us to bicker like Linus Torvalds or Bjarne Straustra. The big thing about programming languages and understanding the procedural versus object-oriented programming language is if you understand what's going on underneath the hood, if you understand how the data is structured, if you understand how to use it efficiently and reliably in a way that progresses efficiently through the machine, then you will be able to be outstanding at implementing the object-oriented programming. So the part about Linus Torvalds saying substandard programmers, I, I don't know about you, but I don't expect any substandard programmers from Notre Dame, right? My father went here, so I, I know the standard. You know, I said, well, Dr. Morrison, you didn't. That's right, I didn't. So. Um, but the crucial thing is, if you understand both, 
you'll be able to uh, do really well. So understanding the portability of objects in classes and abstraction in real world code and robustness of programs, devices, ability to adapt to changing inputs. So what we're gonna do for the last few minutes of lecture is start going into the void. And I wanna break down a pointer into its smallest pieces. A void pointer is nothing more than just pointing to a very specific bit in memory. So let me quickly go over RAM memory. So in RAM, you have the code itself, you have global variables that you've learned about, and then you have functions. And as you call more functions, especially when you do things like recursion, you will see that um, as it builds up, it takes more memory. So the, where we store what's known as dynamic memory, when you build a dynamic array, or for those of you who coded in C, calloc and malloc, you can allocate the memory after the program has become running. You will implement that on the data heap. And the system stack is where you start storing these functions. And eventually you have return. And when you type in return zero, what that also does is it has it go back to the previous location where you made the function. And so this is a general idea of RAM. And what I wanna show you next is how this is broken down. So heap is the area of memory as I've alluded to that can be allocated. And then the stack with the function call. So you have dynamic memory, they grow closer to each other. And if you overflow, you have too much of it, that's what a stack overflow actually is. So that's why we wanna be efficient and reliable with memory and data structures. So we don't have any stack overflow. So one thing you'll notice in the Harvard architecture is that we've split up the instruction memory and the data memory. And the objective there is to separate the, the stack and the heap. We try to have a certain amount of memory allocated for each of them to try to offset some of these stack overflow issues. So I say computing instructions and computing data are separate. And we learn about that a lot more detail about computer architecture. But I can say the same thing by saying the instruction stack and the data heap are physically separate. Aaron, thank you, girl. All right, so then the registers are fast. I kind of alluded to this already. Um, let me skip past that. I told you all that already. Load and store is how we get stuff from the instruction stack and the data heap taking advantage of the register. And the register contains the address of a location on the data heap. So that's what a pointer actually is. It tells me where something actually is. And so what's going on here, let's take a look at a very simple piece of code, nothing.cpp. It has int main and just returns zero. And void means that I'm taking in nothing from the input device. But it's important to know that there's actually more going on underneath the hood when we talk about these different levels of abstraction. So let me walk through this real quick. The braces in C and C++ indicate the beginning of a procedural operation. It's actually a location in the instruction memory that says, all right, this is gonna be, the program starts here, we do certain tasks, and then it ends here. Next, void means we're not taking anything in from any input device. We're not needing anything in from the terminal. It's not going to be available uh, anywhere on the computer. Then return zero, tells us that we send an integer value to the operating system to indicate that we have successfully completed the program. Question. So walking through this, what is nothing actually doing? It's actually doing something. First, we indicate that we want to perform a procedure and we're gonna put that on the instruction stack. Then we're not gonna get anything from the input device. Then, we're going to start the program with this first brace. Then we inform the operating system that we're done uh, successfully. And then the last part, the vinyl brace, is in the instruction memory to in, in, in case that we have completed the program. Hey, does anybody have any questions on that? 
I'll quickly check the chat as well and see. Okay. So now let's go into a little more detail. We're gonna do Hello World. So it's the same program that I've been showing you before. I've described that what it's doing is allocating memory on the data deep and accessing it. So let's walk through with the same kind of thought process that I just did with nothing.cpp and see what the, is actually going on underneath the hood. So each character is what's known as an ASCII value. ASCII is an eight bit representation of a character. And these are all the values. If you go to ASCIItable.com, it actually has all of these, but zero means null. 10 is a new line character. When you did slash 10, you're actually sending an eight bit value with the number 10 in it, so 1010. 0, 1, 0. 34 through 47 represent several mathematical operators. 48 through uh, 57 represents 0 through 9. 65 through 90 are uppercase letters. And 97 through 122 are lowercase. So let's see what's actually going on in the data view. What's actually going on is I have standard C out and I'm sending the number a binary representation of 72 to the output device, and the terminal interprets that as uppercase H. And so we'll do the same thing. Lowercase E is 101, L is 108, O is 111, comma is 44, space is 32. Then we do the same thing with uppercase W, O, R, L, and D. And then we get the standard colon colon ENDL, that stands for end line. And that sends the number 10, and that's how we move down to the next layer in the terminal. And so all that needs to be put in the data memory. And so let's quickly go through and see what this code is actually doing. We have main. Again, we want to establish that we're doing a procedure. Void means we're not taking in anything from the input device. We're starting the procedure with a brace. Hello world is the object of ASCII characters that we're allocating memory onto the data heap. And we call that a string. Standard C out iterates through all of those characters and sends them to the terminal. And L uh, means the new line and then return zero to tell the operating system that we're done. Sorry about that. Okay, so the heap is used for dynamic memory allocation. It can be accessed randomly at any time. I've alluded to this, but let me go to the next slide because the animation shows what's actually gonna go on. So here we have the stack, the registers, and the data heap. And this is how we're gonna conclude lecture for today. So what's actually going on is I go to main and I start the procedure. It puts a copy of the code in the instruction stack and I mix copies of the variables that I will need. When I go to the whole world, what's gonna happen is I create a pointer that points to a location in the instruction, I mean, I'm sorry, on the data heap that contains all the characters and that memory is dynamically allocated on the heap. But the thing is, I can't move this pointer because I need to know where hello world is at any given time. It has to point to the same place. So when I do C out, what's gonna happen is it's going to create another pointer. That other pointer is gonna to point to the same location initially. And then we're gonna learn on Tuesdays this idea of pointer arithmetic. And what's gonna happen is it's going to move each one and then turn them to the terminal. L, O, W, O, R, L, and D. And then it frees those pointers and then it does the same thing with end line, but puts it to the terminal. And then once it's done, it frees the memory on the data heap. That's part of the efficiency and reliability of the memory there. When we do return zero, we clear all the memory off of the stack and free the registers, and then we're done with the program. Okay, so a quick question before I conclude lectures, anybody have any questions on anything we've covered so far? Okay, two quick uh, notes. Please bring in laptop uh, starting Tuesday because that is what we're going. We're going to start doing the in-class coding assignments, 
And then um, same thing, if you want to attend via Zoom, it's always broadcast. I'll upload the lecture video when I get uh, back home. And otherwise, other than that, we've learned how Hello World works and we've seen how it's actually two pointers. I look forward to working with you all this semester and I wish you all a good day.